Good evening and welcome to Harriman Institute's sponsored very interesting discussion tonight entitled The Russian Speaking Community and the Trump Presidency. So the format this evening will be a bit different than many of our ordinary events and we will have Anna Katz Nelson who organized this event um, and she will conduct an interview of the two speakers. And I will introduce each speaker in a minute. Um, and first I'll just um, say a few words about myself and um, welcome you to sign up to the many events that Harriman Institute holds throughout the course of the academic year. I'm Elise Giuliano. I'm a professor of political science here at Columbia University and director of graduate, director of graduate studies of our master's program. I also run the program on US-Russian relations, um, which consists of um, many events, including a series of talks which many of you may be interested in. So again, I urge you to sign up for our email list um, if you're so inclined. Now, to our event this evening. Anna Katznelson, Professor Katznelson, received her PhD in comparative literature in 2011 from the University of Texas at Austin. She most recently is the author of Transnationalism in Contemporary Post-Soviet North American Literature, published in the journal 20th Century Literature. In 2014, she co-organized with Professor Alan Timberlake of Columbia a two-day conference entitled The New Wave of Russian Jewish Cultural Production. In 2016, she co-edited with David Schneer a special issue of the Journal of East European Jewish Affairs entitled The New Wave of Russian Jewish American Culture. It was published by Routledge Press in 2017. She's currently teaching a course here entitled Rebels, Poets, Exiles, 100 Years of Russians and Russian Jews in America. Thank you. And now, you. And now I'll introduce, I'll introduce a, a few, I'll say a few words about each of our panelists before turning it over. Okay, so first we're um, going to hear from Stephen Kaplan, who has hosted the radio, radio and TV show Talkovisha with Seva Kaplan since 1993 and played a foundational role in Russian radio in America. He's been featured in the New York Times, the New York Daily News, and I-24 News on um, I dot ITV. TV. Dot TV. It's an American internet uh, television, I-24 News dot TV. I-24 News dot TV. Right. He was born in Moscow to a family of musicians and educated by the enemies of the people, Samizdat, BBC, Radio Liberty, Voice of America, and others. He has served in the Soviet Army, worked as a bear hunter, held a position in the psychology department at Moscow State University, and was a refusenik and a dissident. From 1989 to 1993, having escaped from the Soviet Union to the US, he worked as a producer and director for the New York office of Radio Liberty. Our next guest, Rafael Shimunov, is an artist and activist from Queens, New York City, who arrived in the US as a Hias child refugee from Russian-dominated Uzbekistan. His narrative live stream from JFK Airport during the first implementation of Trump's Muslim ban garnered 16 million viewers and helped spark airport protests across the country, later landing him a spot on CNN. He's recently installed an unauthorized exhibit at the Whitney Museum to protest the now former co-chair's manufacturing of tear gas and chemical explosives used by Border Patrol on families seeking asylum and he has helped successfully organize Queens residents against building an Amazon headquarters because of the company's ties to ICE, police militarization, and labor abuse. Rafael is an executive board member of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice and is the co-founder of the Jewish Vote and helped grow, if not now, as an early organizer. He's worked with Michael Moore, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Working Families Party, and is a team recipient of a Khan Award for digital agency work. He helped launch the largest national bail fund in history. And with that, I will um, once again r remind you to keep your questions um, until after the interview period of the 
um, of the evening is over, and we'll have a robust um, 30, approximately 30 minutes for a question and answer period. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and now, before we start with the question and answer session with my questions, um, I'll give each of the panelists three minutes to say a word on anything they like. Uh, first of all, I like being here. And if you guys still have your cell phones open, please feel free, free to use them, make selfies, because that would make the whole scene more natural, like in real life. Um, before, um, when, I when it turned out that I would be one of the panelists, I asked my audience, which is like 150,000 people of all walks of life and ages, and uh, on my daily radio show, what would they like for me to say about themselves? It was not easy because the older part of, of the uh, Russian-speaking immigration, um, they're very zipped up. Uh, they learn that silence is gold. Uh, but that, you know, um, was a famous Soviet idiom uh, destined to make slaves after, out of people who could uh, imagine being free in, at some point in their lives. And finally, uh, I got a, a version of this answer from one of the guys which I am going to translate to you. It's like three lines only. What would I say about myself? Uh, we are the consequence of the Soviet suppression. We are fed up with socialist ideas. We don't want any anti-Semitism in the Congress. We are ready to suffer under the Republicans, and he meant uh, social assistance, because uh, the Russians think that uh, Democrats would give them more than the Republicans. Um, Two major blunders I made in my life, it was a judgment, mostly in both cases. One is when I was um, uh, refusing, uh, do everyone, does everyone know this uh, Russian-American word refusenik, derived from the word refuse a visa, with a Russian ending nick? So I was a refusenik for nine years, and um, being born into a family of musicians, um, uh, I thought that all people in the immigration, if I ever have a chance to leave the Soviet Union, would be like myself or close to it. They would be well read, um, they would be uh, very well informed of the real history of their country, they would be open-minded um, and ready to become a mainstream American uh, like all of them, 100%. Turns out I was very far, my opinion was very far from truth. Uh, in reality, um, if you have any particular questions about the reality, I will be glad to answer this question later on. In reality, uh, there are not so many people like myself, and it's not that, like I'm uh, the best of the kind. No, they're all different. Most of our immigration are uh, so-called uh, kalbasne. Uh, they came here for baloney, but not baloney as a bullshit, but as a form of salami. They're economical immigration, and there's nothing bad about it. They never had the chance to read books like after they graduated from high school, they almost never read anything. Now that they live in an um, unfriendly uh, environment where mainstream people don't speak their language of choice, they stopped reading at all. They just read whatever is on the internet, and that's it. And they're very happy about it. So this, is, was, this was one of the uh, major blunders in my life. My judgment uh, taught me a lesson. Uh, don't, um, don't make conclusions before you, you know, go deep into it. Another thing was uh, a real discovery, like every one of us uh, immigrants discover America in ourselves. Another discovery I made about myself is that I realized that I was indeed the enemy of the Soviet people. I was not like them. I was the enemy of the system. And the reason they put me uh, to prison for like 15 days at one point when I just made a, an innocent demonstration uh, with a slogan showing uh, what's happening to my life, uh, I was upset at the time. I was um, ready to fight the KGB and whatever followed them. But uh, after living in the United States for more than 30 years, I realized that the system was right. And those people, whoever they were, slaves or, no, bad terms are not applicable in this particular case. Um, that was their country, it was not mine. So I, I was the enemy of the people. 
And now it turns out that some of those people are becoming the enemy of people like myself, but I'm in the minority. So uh, th this is a really great opportunity for us to get together here to, um, to produce some light on those blank spots which uh, make a united picture of what the Russians in this country are. There are some people who are the fifth column, but they are not a danger. If you remember the, um, one of the um, jungle story um, characters, the white albino cobra, named the White Hood, uh, it outlived its poison. Its fangs dried up, so it cannot bite. Thank you. <laughs> that was uh, pretty amazing to hear because I immediately made conclusions about you before I started this. I saw a bear hunter and I immediately went to town with my imagination. <laughs> and to the point where I brought like security, I have uh, my Chiburashka doll here and then there's another one here it's apparently, safe. <laughs> like <laughs> randomly. But, um, but yeah, there was this, uh, because I guess I'm always, as often many New Yorkers, uh, float between hope and cynicism uh, very frequently. And in the, in the cynical way where I, when I did look you up and watch your YouTube videos and, and your interviews, um, I was expecting, you know, there was a title, shock jock, this, like all of this stuff and just making these assumptions. And then I actually was really moved by your story of like just imagining the image that I'm thinking a lot about is you're sleeping on a piano in a 10 foot room. Yeah, yeah. Your so, father is a pianist. So, so you just you know. stopped being judgmental, right? <laughs> I stopped being judgmental. Okay. And, um, and especially uh, what won me over is when people were calling you Pazor, which I love. <laughs> and I have really? friends with that have that as a tattoo. Pazor means like it's like shame, 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 yeah. shame like a person that should be shamed of themselves. But um, in the positive aspect where I'm operating from when I don't fall into the dark corners of like making assumptions is growing up when my parents uh, fled Uzbekistan, Samarkand, and uh, went through Europe, uh, Vienna, and Italy, Rome, almost settled in Rome until it was actually, uh, people would bomb the mailboxes of the refugee houses uh, in order to deter the negative propaganda against the Soviet Union that <clears throat> the, uh, the West was using when showing images of Jews fleeing um, all the republics, um, in particular Central Asia with us. But when we finally did arrive home, I got to be sort of a, like a, it was almost like I had a radio show because every, you know, as Trump calls it, like chain migration, every few months there was a new family in our home that we were helping sponsor, helping them get, get papers, helping them come to this country. And with every story came all of these inside knowledge about Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And one of them that sticks with me th that kept repeating was the solidarity Muslims and Jews and other people. It was very much like Queens and Brooklyn there. It was very diverse. The solidarity everyone had as the foot of Moscow was on their necks collectively in, in different ways. And in that way, like for example, you couldn't tell, unlike in Europe, you couldn't tell the garb of a Jew or a Muslim in Uzbekistan differently. It was the same clothes. But unlike most, much of Europe, you know, we couldn't just build a synagogue and our rabbis and our imams would get together and decide, oh, there's no idols in the in the mosques, and then the mosques are technically museums, but we, we, we worship there. You can have your bar mitzvah in the mosque. And of course, everything about kosher food preparation was operating on bribes because it was too illegal. Um, but uh, when, when Muslim brothers and sisters had an issue with halal preparation, the imam and the rabbi again get together and and demonstrate why how kosher is halal plus. It's even more selective than halal. And you know, so there was this kind of camaraderie uh, that I got to witness at a very young age um, that kind of influences all of my, my, my hope, really, in, uh, in us, in, in, in change. Okay, thank you so much, both. Um, 
Um, so if a person with a microphone went out onto the boardwalk in Brighton Beach, how many distinct political belief systems do you think they would meet on a single day? <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, it's my deep uh, impression that uh, the world is mistaken about Russians identifying all the Russian-speaking people in this country with the Brighton Beach uh, environment. It's like judging all Italians by the Little Italy neighborhood, but they speak Mandarin over there. They don't speak Italian anymore. So uh, the Brighton Beach uh, changes. Uh, there are still some people who are like the pure bacteria of the Homo Sovieticus, if you remember that term in Latin, who, uh, when they see you, no matter how you look like, no matter how you are dressed up, they judge you. Are you a danger? Are you one of us? Uh, the uh, facial expressions is like you can, it's like a face recognition system which is abused by Facebook and Google, for instance, there's a human kind, human, humanly produced face recognition system among the older part of the Brighton Beach population. They want to see if you are a danger, if you can be used, so it's an old habit, and they look like nobody else among their peers in, the, in Russia and uh, the other former Soviet countries anymore. Their peers don't look like their peers in Brighton Beach. Uh, they uh, are definitely pro-Trump, uh, especially the, the, the 50s up, like up to 90s, they're all, or almost all of them are pro-Trump, with, with a few exceptions based on their health condition. I can give you an example. Uh, I know a guy who was uh, very much pro-Trumpian and pro-Republican until his wife um, left him with all the savings which he took off a bank account. He lost the job and he got cancer, uh, the fourth stage of cancer. Turns out that being poor with no you know, income at all, uh, he uh, used all the advantages of Obamacare. And he was going to die in two years from the moment he was diagnosed. In two years, he went through all the chemical and radiological treatments he is a healthy man, he found a woman, and he's pro-Obama <laughs> for the rest of his life. He lost all his friends. They hate him now. <laughs> so there's another part of the uh, new Brighton Beach population. It's people who come here to get the status. Uh, they are well off. They like the Russian-speaking environment. They don't belong to the uh, Russian immigrants by definition because they are not. They came here to create some kind of a credit card equivalent by buying real estate or paying 100% in cash up front. So they save some money which they make um, in Russia um, f for some unexpected you know, consequences in case uh, Putin decides to nationalize all the bank accounts. So that's the second part. Uh, there's the third part. Uh, it's the younger generation like from um, let's say 20-somethings to 35, 38 years old, those people are children of, uh, they actually they came here when they were in their teen years mostly. Uh, what surprises me a lot is that they still have the Russian, Brooklyn, Jewish kind of an accent. It's not uh, that American English language which you are supposed to hear from, you know, a dictator on TV. Do you recognize their origin by their language? If they are well educated, for instance, um, it's a tricky question because in the older days, like in the 1920s, when the Jews in uh, Russia still live in ghettos, they uh, would teach their kids violin, piano. That was a must. So even you know, a tailor, a shoemaker, always had kids, and they, whatever he had in his pocket, he would pay for his kids to become something else, not like the predecessors in the family. Uh, my folks don't do that anymore. No, they don't teach, the majority don't, don't teach their kids music anymore. They want them being uh, doctors, uh, lawyers, or lawyers and doctors, maybe the order doesn't uh, make any difference. So uh, these people are business oriented. They, uh, 
they are good for the society. They don't have any education, they are street smart, they are bilingual enough to use the advantage of their origin. Uh, and that's basically it, Tanya. Thank you. Rafael, did you want to add? Um, sure. I mean, just to add to that, from that's a fine analysis from that perspective and got me thinking about a lot. But from this other perspective, as a Bukharian, as someone from Central Asia, what I'm also seeing in different types of people, one thing I'm going to put for the second point, which is extremely alarming and unique, but I would start with the fact that... Um, that there is an internalized, like, like colonialist mentality throughout a lot of the, uh, a lot of the different populations that we're going to observe in Brighton Beach and in Queens and Fort Eagle Park, and uh, all over the city, um, and that is one like that. You know, I can have my my mother, who is the most like, gentle, caring person in the world, who grew, who I would stay up late at night just so I can hear her story. She did double shift as a nurse in a, in, a, in, a, in a hospital that tended to AIDS patients during the epidemic. And she, her best friends became people, trans people, uh, LGBTQ people who contracted AIDS and people who were drug, uh, drug addicted who contracted AIDS, HIV, and she would come home and she would tell these beautiful stories in their voice, which was like, to me, the first example of like, the deepest empathy when you when you compose someone's voice and she would like it was like a play at 11 p.m. I would be sitting in bed and we grew up in in the projects in Queens and uh, there was a lot of noise always but I made sure to stay up for 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 her stories but even with her, her she had to fight her reflex on blaming them for for their condition and also even in in, in, a, in, a, in a tribalist way where us versus them because of their behavior mm -hmm. they're in the situation even though she would sacrifice every day without pay all her time even against our own personal important life kind of events she would sacrifice for them she would give them even her kidney if she had to yet automatically assuming this internalized kind of colonialist mentality that when someone is suffering that they're suffering solely because of the choices they made <laughs> Um, and that's, I see in different degrees uh, with older former Soviet people, but also what's more alarming that I wanted to touch on and not really expand too much on, right, is that this conservative ideology was often had one weakness and it was youth culture and it was this in inability to penetrate youth culture. And right now that's changing. Right now in, in um, Brooklyn and Greenpoint, the Proud Boys can make a base and they can recruit young Polish kids and young Ukrainian kids and somehow convince them <laughs> that, that, they are, that they are part of this, this imaginary tribe um, that they should be part of. And this is the, really, the, to me, the most alarming of all the people we would, we would go and uh, of, of people who, who know better and uh, who are manipulated into this. This is historically, we've never seen something like that. Um, but we can touch on that more. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So now I'd like to ask you about uh, the reasons, right? Um, so the older generation of Russian-speaking immigrants overwhelmingly voted for Trump and voted for the Republican Party in the previous two elections. Do you think being reliable conservative voters comes down to being permanently scarred by communism? And I'll, I wanna continue asking that way. I'll ask a few more questions and then you could take it away. Um, it has been said that Russians have never truly experienced democracy in their history. Is it an authoritarian past and desire, whether openly stated or subconsciously held, to be ruled by an iron fist that makes them seek out politicians like Trump? And to speak about this younger generation who are liberal, um, secular Jews in the US, especially in New York, have tended to be politically liberal. Um, to what extent um, so how does this younger generation maybe possibly espouse that political belief system? And to what extent does Israel uh, play a role in, in influencing Russian-speaking immigrant politics? Okay. Who's first? <laughs> Same order? Yeah, we can do it. 
Mm. Okay. Um, being conservative by choice when it comes to general elections uh, is dictated by uh, the um, older Russian voters' hatred towards the words which they identify with socialism. Democrats to them are synonymous to socialists. And that's it, no discussion. So they hate socialism, despite the fact that they don't understand the difference between the Soviet version of socialism and the real socialism, which they uh, enjoy, by the way. Uh, especially those who never worked in this country and who get benefits um, exceeding the uh, pensions of the you know, middle class Americans who work their, all their lives. And they make way less in their pension funds than the people who never work today here. So the, it's a duplicity which they like. On the one hand, it's like, okay, this is for me and this is for the society. Uh, Trump, why Trump? It's, uh, it's, uh, there are many versions of answers to these uh, questions and each one of them might be true. It's like when you talk about art. Everybody sees like we are all blind people trying to evaluate uh, a huge elephant. And six uh, blind people are not enough, you know, to, to give the entire picture. So uh, I have my mm, view on the pro-Trumpism. Um, I think it's based on the fact that um, he speaks a familiar language. He speaks the language of the great predecessor named Lenin. Vladimir Lenin, when, uh, in 1918, after the uh, October Revolution, uh, the Bolsheviks, the predecessors of the communists, uh, were in a minority in a war-torn apart country with no finances except for some German you know, support for Lenin being a spy for the Germans. Uh, but he found the right rhetoric. Uh, bloody enemies, uh, we're not slaves, short terms, short phrases, which uh, uh, simple, so-called simple people understand, ordinary people understand this kind of a language. They don't dig the PBS and New York Times shit. There is no way, even some, you know, Kremlin-based uh, in, uh, uh, internet interpreter systems like Inapressa, which translate uh, the New York Times on a daily basis with some quotes all missed over there because I check, you know, I do check uh, uh, fact checking w once in a while when a topic is controversial. Uh, so um, Trump speaks their language uh, and being formally, being slaves in their uh, mother country, they are in constant search of another master. It's like that famous movie, uh, the um, Night Portier. How, how is it? Night Portier, National Portier. Night yeah, Porter. Night, night Porter. Yeah. You remember the plot? This young woman who is married to a nice violinist, uh, they come after the Second World War, they come to a hotel where the man who works the front desk turns out to be a torturer who raped her when she was in the uh, concentration camp. She was a 12 year old girl. It was the ultimate disaster of her life. And uh, she sees him and she falls in love with him. Same story with him. It's a very, very complicated matter. So the Russians it's who you. Home syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah. So the Russians who used to be slaves, not because they were the Soviet citizens, not all Soviet citizens were slaves, but some of them realized that they. They had no choice. Uh, they, they, they are in constant search of a new master. And Trump is the most appropriate figure. That's why. Thank you. I, I, I guess I, I agree trauma is at play, but I, don't, I think it's almost, and I don't think you mean to be or people mean to be, but it's almost like a cop-out for something that's bigger. Um, if you look at... Um, the, in, in the U.S., in New York, in my experience, and in, in, in elected officials and a lot of places, um, there is systemic racism everywhere, 
all over th th across the board with every group. Um, but often in the room, the one who's speaking about it proudly uh, is coming from a community who was attacked before for being less than. In Europe, Irish people and Italian people and Polish people were looked quite down upon, and when they came to the United States, they were quite excluded along with black Americans uh, and Asian Americans. And uh, at the point where there was this also demographic instability or fear, they were handed to them the white card, like the temporary white card. There's a great piece by Eric Ward called Skin in the Game that people should read. And it is about that card that's handed to people who want to opt into the myth of whiteness. And in order for them to maintain that card, because they can't with their history and they can't with oftentimes even with their skin, they have to do be the racist who's the loudest in the room and be the most overt person in this. And in, in the case of Russians, there is also an inferiority complex about not being in Western Europe to many people that's embedded in the culture and in, in, in conversations that I've had with people that it's very evident. And, and part of this opportunity of coming to the United States is to, it's like going to a new school where I was like not very popular in middle school and I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna reinvent myself in, the, in high school, I'm gonna wear my collar up, I'm gonna, everything's gonna change because I'm gonna wear my collar up and I'm gonna play volleyball or whatever. And what <laughs> the reality is that they are earning that and now it's actually happening to Jews in, in, a, in a large extent as well where they are actually attacking left Jews like me as an enemy and questioning my identity and at the same time making bedfellows and sharing stages. I've seen rabbis share stages with Milo. I've seen rabbis share stages with, with Richard Spencer. In, in, uh, I mean, I'm not Richard Spencer, with Proud Boys uh, founder. And uh, all in this, this kind of theater, theater of this like mythology of, of, of white supremacy. So I think it's a little bit of a cop out, even though it's true that trauma is at play and like as the engine and all of this. But really, it's it's intense, intense racism embedded in 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 our societies right now. If we look, and not just racism, right now if we look at general statistics in Russia and other former Soviet places, but in in particular Russia, it is the highest offender, one of the highest offenders of women, of LGBTQ, of anyone outside of the, the lines that are defined. And when you're taking a population and a culture from that and transplanting them around the world, that doesn't disappear. We didn't only get the best. We also got a good sample of people who have beautiful stories, who are amazing people, and who are operating with a degree of racism in their lives. And so that's where, like I just see kind of the trauma argument, which is also apparent with uh, Jewish Americans too, which oh, because of our trauma, we, we, we have to do this and we, ha we can't hear this word and we can't hear this kind of criticism. But at the end, it's, it's putting yourself's value about, above someone else's. Um, and the other part is, I think to touch on that point and, and agree with the point about the authoritarian need. Uh, someone, a labor organizer, once told me, your life is dictated by your first boss, which is very, a very powerful argument, because I've seen people, and myself, when I had my first project, like, oh, this is, I guess, this is what it's like to be working? Like, I'm supposed to work 20, 80 hours a week and, and then and bring the coffee to everyone, all of these things, and, and, and be abused. There is nothing to compare it to. But in reality, your first boss is really your parents. And when I see uh, different types of parents, the way that they engage with their child, in which don't do this because I told you, versus don't do this because you're gonna lose time and you're gonna damage this thing you care about. If you damage it, we, we, I can't cook dinner and you're gonna lose time and you won't watch your show. Like this logical process of thinking versus uh, embedding in them the seed of, of wanting to, uh, an authoritarian 
to, to, to control them. Be that authoritarian will be a husband or a wife or whoever. Be that authoritarian will be a politician or a boss. It starts with childhood and how we raise it. And there is big questions in, our, in all of our cultures about how we're raising our children and what we're setting them up for. And then just to end, the, the one story that I shared in the beginning about these positive stories that I've had where people came in in my house for so many years and shared this solidarity story. Guess what? As the Israeli propaganda came, the right-wing Israeli propaganda came, their stories changed. Those same people that I'm moved by, my same people that I love, my, my aunts and cousins and friends, the, the, the ones that gave me those beautiful stories and said how they fled Moscow, how they fled persecution, and they didn't have the words for it, but what they were saying is that they fled white supremacy disguised as communism. And w that story now changes. And if I ask those same very people, they said they fled Muslims. They said they fled the people that we were both collaborating with against for our safety. They said that we fled Muslims because Muslims are inherently oppositional and dangerous to Jews and to, uh, to everybody. So the idea of Israel's role is that, is that we are just like anyone. It's not particularly former Soviet people that are susceptible to propaganda. We know that Russian propaganda has been very successful with non-Russian people on Facebook in Milwaukee, in Michigan. And uh, it is basically, that is the, the, the role all of these outside interests play now. And as we're becoming more concentric, smaller in terms of this network, every single decision that we're making, everything that we're doing, there are 50 different interests worldwide that are trying to modify our behavior. Okay, thank you so much. Anya, uh, if I may, I, I missed this point in your question yeah. because I didn't make any notes. It's very important, uh, just one minute. Okay. Um, I, I can't recall exactly when it happened, but I was happy uh, and lucky to do an interview with Ariel Sharon while, while he held the hunger strike in a tent in front of Knesset. It was like about 20 years ago. He spent like a month in that tent. And uh, Ariel Sharon, uh, no question, was a savior of Israel because uh, had it not happened to him being the leader of the Israeli uh, military forces uh, in that uh, six-day war, uh, Israel could have ceased to exist. All of a sudden, this uh, obvious hawk is uh, turning into something else. He's not like... He used to be, and people stopped loving him, like overnight, literally. Uh, he's becoming so soft, and uh, the suppressed people will never forgive any softness in their leaders. That's why the Russians hate soft leaders. Uh, it's not enough, and it's a racist thing to say that they hated Obama because he was black, because Russians are racist by definition, by origin. He was too soft for them. Um, and one more thing, which is very paradoxical and interesting. No Russian who uh, grew up in the Soviet Union loves Putin, but they accepted Putin. They did accept him when Putin said something nice of Trump. I took out you, because you said Ariel Sharon, so, but then you went the right way. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Raphael, you brought up something which is, I have that I want to follow up on. Um, this is kind of like a long preamble to my question, but bear with me. According to the Anti-Defamation League, the organization that tracks hate crimes and anti-Semitic crimes in the US, in the three years before the 2016 election, from 2012 to 2015, there were, according to their website, on which I spent a lot of time, there were zero anti-Semitic incidents in the country. In the three-year period that Donald Trump became the Republican nominee and president from 2016 and 2019, the number of anti-Semitic incidents went up to 5,132. These incidents included assault and vandalism, and of course the most violent anti-Semitic attack on U.S. soil, uh, the attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. In 2018, uh, a neo-Nazi targeting the Jewish organization Hias 
the same immigrant organization instrumental in getting Jews from the Soviet Union resettled in the United States, killed 11 worshipers at the synagogue, but explained that he was targeting it because of its ties to Hyas, which has since refocused on since it resettled Soviet immigrants, it has since refocused on resettling other non-Jewish immigrant communities. To what extent have your listeners, Sieva, or uh, your community, Raphael, uh, of, of activists, tied Trump's anti-immigration rhetoric to a rise in extremist neo-Nazi activity in the US, including the Unite the Right rally in Virginia, when a neo-Nazi killed one woman and other neo-Nazis chanted, Jews will not replace us. And to what extent did your listeners tie the anti-immigrant rhetoric to an attack on this immigrant organization that was responsible for settling hundreds of thousands of Soviet Jews? Yeah, the, there is a discrepancy in their judgment. Uh, I, whenever the anti-Semitism acts, occurred in this country during the Trump rule, I would o always, like, always ask the same questions which are not good for the show. You cannot be predictable. You, you'll fail. But nevertheless, I ask questions um, about uh, obvious things which are really not uh, that uh, hard to judge about, like killing Jews in the American synagogue uh, had been unprecedented. And, uh, why those people who dared to do this um, did it under Trump rule? Because he is a role model, and uh, the man with extreme power should always be the role model for the whole world. But he has never been, and that's his strongest point. I think that he may win the next elections because of that. Because simpletons identify with him. So uh, when I hit the weak spot of our community, uh, which does not exist in my mind, because community derives from the word union, and they hate union because it's like Soviet Union, it's very close. Uh, so they're in self-denial. So um, they, the first people who would react were all the women, babushkis. You know, it's very, very uh, important to understand that the first uh, people who sense danger are old women. It has always been like this. And they always tried to get as close as possible to the hungry wolf. They wanted to be next to it. That's the safest spot. It's like going under radar. So they would start calling me and saying, oh, you are brainwashed, you are leftist, you are a liberalist. Uh, it's like, you understand the derivation of this word? And um, <clears throat> so after 20 years being the um, uh, most loved boy of my community, I became the enemy of my people. Exactly the way it happened in a bigger scale, much larger scale with Ariel Sharon. And I can give you many examples. When you um, change your agenda, it's like uh, in the Orwellian 1984, the slogan changed, but the crowd is still on the square. Hmm. They're at a loss. They can't forgive it to you because you're in charge. How come? You're not with us anymore. We go east, and all of a sudden, you command to go west. When I explain, uh, not explain, I try to deliver this message that Moses led his people through the desert for 40 years because he wanted the, the people who could not learn the new tricks to die before they reach the uh, ultimate destination. It was just a one-week journey, and everybody knows it, that there should have been a reason, no matter whether it's true or it's a myth. It doesn't matter. So uh, babushkis are the barometer of the danger in the world. And it happens in every society. No matter whether you're Italian, Jewish, uh, Russian, doesn't matter. When you hear the um, trembling voices of old women, you should be on alert. I'm more worried about their fists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Babushka Defense League, yeah? Um, yeah, I guess, of course, like uh, ADL's analysis of things are often also tainted, which is very unfortunate. 
This is 100% true about the rise in anti-Semitic incidents. It's strange that they recorded zero prior, but the idea that they are also, even the ADL, an institution that we need dearly to, to focus on their mission, even they have recently, with their leadership with Jonathan Greenblatt, have recently succumbed to parsing their one job is to tell us when something is dangerous, when we're in trouble. And now they parse even that with if it, how it affects Israel and how it affects people who ideologically, the leaders in Israel, have nothing almost in common with ADL or the people who work at the ADL. So much so that, for example, the staff and the researchers of ADL who are brilliant were tasked to create a report about the boycott. And there's a, there's a lot of different feelings, and I sway back and forth, but about like the Palestinian call to boycott Israel in order to uh, meet their, their uh, demands. And in the US, and at least on the liberal front, the idea is that whether you agree with it or not, it's, it's, it's a free speech tool that's been used before and that it shouldn't be criminalized. So these analysts, when they did their homework, told the leadership of ADL, listen, this is bad for us. We cannot be Jews who are going to be the first group in the U.S. to, to go after the constitution of a free speech for us and, and begin to, that's going to cause anti-Semitism, that we, we would be creating something that would, we're fighting against. We cannot do that. He, he threw that out. It was leaked out because people were so upset. And they, they immediately went with his leadership to, 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 to support criminalizing of that speech. This is the kind of stuff when I see with gas, like in St. Louis, outside of the, the squirrel, outside of the, the shooting, there were, there were hints of this already. In St. Louis, there was a police march, an uh, anti-police uh, violence march by activists, Black Lives Matter activists. When they were cordoned off by police and tear gassed, they fled to a synagogue, and the synagogue opened their doors to them in a, what they called, quote unquote, radical hospitality. And they fed them, and they defended them, and they didn't let police in, just like they won't let ICE in for immigrants. And when that happened on Twitter, the hashtag started trending, gas the synagogue, by Nazis, by neo-Nazis. And there was this chance, and it became a trending topic on Twitter. And even with that, our community was not able to come together against that enemy in a case where all we have is solidarity to survive. When Trump won, progressives, people of color, immigrants, had 51% of the US population that votes, 51%. We cannot afford to break off in any way. We have to exercise union to survive, even if it's triggering to our community and others. We have to figure out a way to address the communities, old and young and everything, for our survival because we, we're not gonna, we cannot win just on a skin color or some made up story about our origin like they can. Um, so the topic is the ADL numbers. Yes, it's scary. It absolutely has to do with Trump, but what does, who created Trump? Trump is also a cop out. Trauma is a cop out. Trump is a cop out. There's Trumpism even before Trump. How, how did we get to the point where we celebrate someone like Trump? There are people now which we call Resistance Incorporated, David Frum and other kind of people who are now washing their hands of their crimes, of what they did and what they did daily to create the environment for Trump by just saying they're anti-Trump. So it's not enough to be against Trump, it's to understand at the root cause of what operates with us on colonialism, on racism, on sexism, on anti-LGBTQ uh, hate, all of that, to really go in and have those uncomfortable conversations and push that dial. And we could do it, I've seen it, and it's not logic. Russians love logic and uh, appreciate logic, but it's, we can operate logic on how to deal with emotions. But at the end of the day, it's emotional. It's this one-on-one -on -one talks. The only things that ever 
helped us was that, that can push the dial are those conversations with people who are actually impacted by, by what's happening. May I contradict a little bit? <clears throat> I think uh, that, and maybe this is the reason uh, why that these two guys sitting here on this stage, I think that we uh, do have to celebrate Trump at times because uh, um, the product, <laughs> the product first by Raphael was really good, but it's really hard to sell. It's all about art of sales. As a showman, I know that uh, no matter how wise your thought is and well packaged, it should be wrapped up in whatever all the buyers would see as, you know, challenge and they want to get this stuff. Trump is a, an uh, entire thesis to the previous uh, generation of politicians who are very far from, from a certain part of uh, silent uh, voting community. So um, he's a shock therapy to this country. And it's good sometimes, you know, it's like uh, you need to, to shed some blood if you get too fat and slow. Because when people, the, our, the percentage of voters is so low. I spoke to uh, Avigdor Lieberman about half a year ago. I asked him, uh, how many people go to vote in general elections? It was like uh, five months ago. Today they have another uh, elections. Five months ago, he said 60%, not enough, too low. And I know that in New York, uh, when we have like 35%, I can't recall when it was last time, 35 is like high, it's a lot, because we, are, we don't have any uh, problems to you know, produce uh, this kind of percentage, which is appropriate for Israel, for countries, in, uh, under bad uh, con conditions. So <clears throat> there is some use to Trump. Um, plus, uh, I consider that politics is like a swing. Uh, if it's too much now and he is high up, then there will be another moment, not necessarily in the next elections, because uh, for now I think that the only person who could uh, you know, conquer Trump should be a Republican. The Democrats, in my mind, continue playing the same card which failed them in the previous elections in 2016. Plus, uh, the self-esteem of the uh, silent crowd, which uh, cannot grab any arguments, pronounced by my dear friend just now. They, cannot, they don't dig it. They don't get it. It's not their food for thought. So we need it as uh, you know uh, means to um you know to even things up to everybody's you know pleasure ultimately do we have a minute um, yeah i have yeah. other questions yeah um, just, one one just one minute oh. <laughs> okay it's just okay um, okay so russian speaking uh, Jews immigrating in the 70s and 80s and early 90s came because of the Jackson Vonick agreement, an agreement ironed out by two Democrats, Jackson and Vonick. The Jackson Vonick Amendment was a historical reparation to Jews who had not been let in during the Holocaust because of draconian anti immigration laws passed in the early 1920s, which meant to keep the less desirable Southern and Eastern Europeans out of the United States. And that was, of course, a euphemism for mostly for Jews, of course, also Italians. Um, now, Russian-speaking immigrants overwhelmingly support a president who is anti-immigrant. Why, or maybe how is the better question, did they so quickly become blind to their own history? Even Ayn Rand, maybe the first and certainly most famous Russian-speaking American conservative, once said, how could I advocate restricting immigration when I wouldn't be alive today if our borders had been closed? <laughs> uh, there are two ways to answer this question, Anya. First uh, is that um, the Russians of the kind you kind of mean, uh, they like to have the whole blanket for themselves. Plus, the, um, in the Soviet army, uh, and it's a very well-known fact uh, internationally, when you were recruited, uh, you were suffering for the first year of your service, and then you would become a guy who was about to be demobilized, and you would make others who came after you suffer. So it's uh, in their um, subconscious, they want it. They want to um, 
feel like they are the masters of the universe. Same, uh, same reason, uh, like I said before, that they see a master, a new master in Trump. Um, again, with like fears is actually really a good point because there's uh, very few studies that are successfully showing what people could do to, to change a needle with someone. And one of them is to make them feel on the inverse, uh, on the opposite side of that, to make someone feel more powerful. Um, even there was a Yale study when you ask a survey, uh, if you preface the survey with nothing, and you get a cross-section of conservative thinking and, and liberal thinking across every group. Uh, and then when you preface it with, can, uh, can you imagine yourself, like uh, you have a superpower, pick a superpower, just on the phone, and people choose flying, they choose being bulletproof. Uh, my Russian friends might choose like a flying Lexus with a white interior. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, once they just did that exercise for a little bit, and they were asked the same questions, they began to become liberal. They began to, to, to be generous. They began to uh, see other people as, as a sort of extension of each other. Um, the other thing that has worked is this long form conversations where they're outside of the identity of the person. Where, because once the, moment, the moment you go into a person and you question anything that is connected to the scaffolding which holds up their identity, you're subconsciously telling them that their mother lied to them, their father lied to them, their holy book lied to them, their teachers, everything was a lie, um, versus showing, one funny version is, showing someone how someone else fell for some trick. So you, instead of going to someone in Brooklyn and saying, you're an idiot, you're, you, you have social welfare, you have Medicare, you have uh, bu su subsidized housing, Trump wants to take all of that away and you're, you're voting for him? Mm -hmm. versus, or, versus saying, you know what they did in Minnesota? Wall Street came by, underfunded the schools, underfunded the hospitals, underfunded housing, then watched it crumble and said, look, public works doesn't work. Privatization is your savior. And then bought it and sold it to pieces to their friends. And you can have a laugh with that person about how, how moronic <laughs> this person is. And now you have seeded in their mind sort of like the blueprints of how people are manipulated. Um, so there's a lot of like, there's a lot of things we can do to change to ch change the dial, but as we mentioned, with the pendulum and all of this, like what you mentioned earlier in terms of the good things about Trump, like I understand what you're saying, but that's also like the answer to that is also, uh, it's like an indicator of how safe someone is. So the more that they're able to say, well, here are the good things that happened for Trump, the more safe they are from what Trump is doing right now. Um, so I'm not gonna go and say that there's a silver lining with Trump. And I also believe that the pendulum idea is one that Russians used with me, or Russian speakers and former Soviet people have used with me, where, oh, this is just, it's like a sports team. It's like one day the Raiders win, one day this team wins, this and that. It, it helps minimize the importance of it. When I see a child in a cage, when I see the drilling that's gonna happen, all of the restrictions, when I see a parking lot in Yellowstone and global warming coming here, when that pendulum swings, it's my duty to come and, and, and be lifted by each other and hammer that thing as far to the left as possible. Because we have seen what it is, not Trump. We have seen what, what you said, where we have to get a Republican. All of which who co-sign on Trump right now. All of which who co-sign on ethnic cleansing and many different terminology you can use for it, but it's ethnic cleansing and it's racial purity. That's done. The person who planted that pot, they're not the person that's gonna save us. 
And we have to have a strong bolting. Trump didn't win by mesmerizing the country. 14% of the country, that's why he's there. Because he motivated people emotionally at the core. And that's what we have to do on the left. And we can't do that on the left with centrist and third way and, oh, let's find a reasonable Republican. No one's gonna go and knock on a door for that. You're gonna lose people. You need to energize people and tell them that you have been robbed, your parents have been robbed, their parents have been robbed, America was never great, it's a great dream that we've never achieved, and we and this generation can achieve it. That's what makes people come and hit the door, and that's how we're gonna win. We're not gonna win with this logical idea of, of well, we have to give and take, and this and this, and, and, and give the keys back to the person who planted the seeds of Trump. Okay, at this point, we'd like to open it up to um, questions from the audience. So if you have a question, and uh, please no lengthy comments, please introduce yourself. And we have uh, microphones that will come to you if you just raise your hand. Thanks. Hi, my name is Aliyah. I'm in the journalism program here at Columbia. I have a question about the rhetoric you said about Russians want the whole blanket for themselves. I reported on Russian-speaking immigrants uh, in Brighton Beach, and the rhetoric I got is that Brighton Beach is changing. There are more people from Central Asia who take care of the aging Russian population. They work in assisted livings. Do you think the whole um, the agreement with Trump's um, anti-immigrant stance, it comes from the fact that they might have inter-ethnic um, uh, conflicts or... I got you. Yeah, definitely. Your guess is right. To the um, third wave of the immigrants, uh, which started up in the 1970s, uh, people from Central Asia are partially Muslim, you know? And you know that. Uh, even though they might be Jews, they're still not exactly the kind of Jews like the Soviet Jews who came here under Jackson Vanek. Uh, same story in Israel. If you're a, like, for instance, um, my mother was Russian by nationality. My father was Jewish. I don't belong to either one of those people. The Russians consider me Jewish, the Jewish consider me Russian. I consider myself both. But there's no people like both. So uh, your guess is absolutely right. The um, people from Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Uyghurs, uh, the guys at, who lived uh, in the northern part of China, who were very su suppressed by the Chinese regime, uh, they are all exemplarily uh, business-oriented. They will be very uh, useful and helpful to this world. They diversify our American population. It's not a basket of eggs which will help us survive no matter who the next version of Trump is gonna be to this country. Because Trump is a diagnosis. We are really sick. But I wouldn't like for all of you to think that we are here uh, just uh, self-hating self leftists who deny, you know, uh, their origins. No, uh, I love uh, the people who hate me, not because I'm a saint, but because I think that we are all a human jungle and we should preserve ourselves no matter how ugly might be. And the President of the United States is not an exception. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, Could you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Elena Gorelick. Um, so I've been here since 92, pretty standard, came from Minsk, parents, engineers, artists, the whole thing. Um, I really came here for like a mild form of therapy because I, <laughs> I discovered that my parents voted for Trump and we're a very small family, I have no cousins, it's just the three of us. And we've essentially not spoken, we went from speaking like three times a day to like barely talking maybe once a month. Um, 
a lot of what you were saying, um, you know, I've, I've been puzzling over two years. I, I don't understand how this could have happened. My mom was an ardent um, Hillary supporter. She went to see her during the primaries when she ran against Obama. And I honestly don't know whether they did vote for Obama. I assume they did because they're incredibly progressive. They are, you know, the classic dissidents and the rest of it. And in the last two years, in a limited um, contact I've had with them, you know, we try to keep it apolitical. We know that this is a very sensitive subject. I've started hearing some things come from their mouths that are, you know, borderline racist and a little bit horrifying, things that they would have never in a million years said to me before. My dad does a fair amount of work in Korea, um, and he now refers to his um, clients as well as his business partners by referencing their eye shape, which, again, this is not something that they would have ever said. I'm 42 years old. I've known them fairly well. And so what I want to ask is, obviously, there's no way to understand why this is happening. Um, they've never watched Russian TV. They don't have very many Russian friends up until recently. And I think that maybe the way to explain some of this sudden Trumpism is this desire to reconnect with people that they have more or less you know, moved away from and see how much like you, I'm also a mix. And that's one of the reasons that I felt like my parents were very progressive because they were, you know, not welcome back home and they certainly weren't welcomed here by the Jewish community that saw them as wrong. And so I guess my question to you is, A, do you have any words of wisdom for, oh my God, how do I do this for the next, hopefully, one and a half years? And then the other question is, what kind of a candidate do you think would appeal to someone like my parents? I understand that we have, you know, for the bleeding heart leftists, we have ideas and desires and so forth, but we also have to be realistic. And is there a candidate that you see right now in the democratic field that you think might bring my parents back? Yeah. Um, the DSA asked me to translate some materials, for, to find people to translate materials. I don't think I would be able to do it that well, and um, where they were going to get Russian-speaking doors and convince them to vote for the most uh, like uh, transformative district attorney in Queens that we've ever seen. And the first thing I told them, I'm like, this is not going to work unless you take the name Democratic Socialist off of the top. There's no mat there's no way of explaining that out. It's like immediately you're just triggering someone's thing, even though it's un unfair. <laughs> And what we have learned with Working Families Party is knocking on doors and actually leading with the issues, even in those in our communities, uh, is very successful. To the point where racism always trumps it, to you know, pun intended, where where you would be at a door and someone would be completely like, wow, you guys exist? You think I should, my, I should get a minimum $15 minimum wage, that we should have a child care, and we should, have a, uh, we should decriminalize drugs, and this and that. And, um, and they gave a big donation. They signed up to the list. And the person who's also blue eyes, blonde hair, leaving the, their, their, their uh, steps, door closes. He's, he's happy he got a check for, for a donation. Door opens again. And the guy says, come here, come here, come here. But for who? Who is this for? Us? And he's like, yeah. But just us? He's like, well, everybody. Everybody? And then he asked for his check back. Yeah. So it's, it is an important point. Like, do we go and fight the root cause of the stuff? We don't have time. But we also, it's too important not to. Right? So that's why I'm actually one of the few people excited to see that Bernie, for example, is running and Warren is running. And to see both of those projects uh, fight, not each other, but fight for a, a, a market share and, and try to expand those two worlds as much as possible. And then in the end, they better decide, if they don't get rid of Biden, they better decide which one should stick around for the vote and which one should, 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 should support the other. And I hope that they're both able to work on both those things, both the practicality of this emergency and also the root cause of why. For example, the Uzbeks and the Tajiks that are in Queens and in Brooklyn, they're not there because people decided, hey, I want to help them out. They're there because we've internalized 
a colonialist and, and ex, ex, uh, exploitative mentality where we want their labor. We want someone that can cook plov and gosh gajet and someone that we can pay below minimum wage. So we're one step above on the ladder and now we're immediately put our foot on someone else. We have to fight both. And that's why I'm really actually one of the few people happy to see that. And I do think Warren can make a case with a lot of people, but it's going to require all of us seeding the conversation changers in people's heads. You're not going to convince someone at a dinner table, and it's not going to be revolutionary. It's going to be seeding your experiences, being honest, being upfront with them, and walking away. Um, and hoping that that ch changes the dial. But yeah, that's my, my opinion. Um, I would like to say something uh, to, to you also. Um, I've been talking to people on the radio for more than 20 years, so I literally spoke to tens of thousands of people. Some of them are repetitive uh, listeners, but there are also others who are like um, an expert for a moment. That's what I'm looking for, an expert for a moment, for a topic. <laughs> Um, my understanding is that uh, the main point in your question was that your parents, they are not uh, brainwashed by the Kremlin propaganda. They started watching the Russian um, overseas TV only recently. Uh, the reason to it is that the older uh, generation of Russian-speaking immigrants were culturally deprived. They are vi victims of cultural genocide because uh, the uh, reading was very limited certain literature, especially related to the regime, was uh, um, very limited. For instance, uh, I remember when I was a dissident, I remember a, a guy from Armenia who was serving seven years in prison for having a Norwegian copy of 1984. And after he did the first three years, uh, the authorities officially acknowledged that the book was about actually the British Empire, not about us, and it could be published uh, openly. But nevertheless, that guy completed the, the entire seven-year term. So um, these people uh, who um, have no roots, actually, um, they um, came to this country um, and started working hard. Some of them changed their occupation. They lost uh, the uh, power they had in their previous society. They, he he, would be, he could have been an actor or a poet, and now he's a taxi driver. And um, he hates his life. Uh, the only consolation these people have is that they work for their families. They are becoming a fertilizer for the family. And it's a very common, you know, term, very common expression. They are trying to um, save themselves from self-hatred because th this feeling of an accomplishment, unaccomplishment in life, it's very damaging. That's why, uh, without being able to understand uh, the mainstream society of this country and becoming a part of it, they want to expand their so-called inner circle. That's why they do it. That's why they unite with the dumb and morons, you know, folks who are galore on the internet, just to expand it, to feel this power. Okay, another question? Um, the woman in the back and then this gentleman. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Sandra Kirtescu. I'm a PhD candidate in Yiddish studies at Columbia. I just had a question about gender and you touched a little on it with the babushki. I was just wondering if you see any difference at all between um, men and women in their leaning towards Trump at all or if it's sort of across the board. Because I know there, I've read about some differences in other communities in that regard. Uh, there's a different um, difference between uh, these two genders. There are many more as we know, but between two, these two genders. Uh, Russian males, uh, they identify with Trump in a different way. Uh, Russian older females do because um, they are sexists by origin, they're chauvinist. Well, all the Russian males, uh, like up to 35, are male chauvinist pigs. It's a known fact. So when the guy says that if you grab her by a pussy and uh, she's happy because you're rich and famous, it's me, I want to be like you. <laughs> um, 
from my experience, uh, we have, for example, the anti-Trump Soviet Facebook group, which you should all check out. Um, it's pretty great. It started by women, and largely the engine of it is women. And that's no different with anything in terms of like resistance to Trump. It is largely led by women. All the victories are almost all attributable to women. And even the men who have uh, success with it have a lot of women doing the work that we don't see. Um, and in particular, uh, it is the, the antidote to Trumpism and the chauvinism. And it's just so much bigger if you look throughout the whole world. It's sort of like uh, overwhelming because you start seeing this pattern happening in Poland and all, all, uh, Brazil and all over the world where I'm like, oh my God, there's so many more enemies than, than, than I'm talking about, but also so many more allies, right? Um, but the, the antidote to that and the reason why they're so protective of like the, the toxic masculinity, the toxic version of masculinity, why they're so scared of that is because it's really like the antidote to this is feminism. It's feminism in, in action by men, by women, by any, anybody. And um, so in terms of like that discussion, my question is where can we pick up from our cultural traditions emotionally, not logically, emotionally, where women are powerful? And one idea like you mentioned, for example, earlier was babushki, right? And there's this two like versions of that. One is like the fearful thing. But in reality, it was actually Babushki's reputation is pretty tough and it's pretty thick skin. And, uh, and I do, I, I loved my Babushka's <laughs> fist when I told her a story of when I was like trounced by some bully at school and, and, and the advice she gave me. So there is a certain type of feminist strength that is the antidote to all of this to the exploitation piece, to all of the root causes of this. And the solution isn't like uh, these kind of band-aids, like uh, the transformational stuff. If we can link it culturally, just like when, in terms of like organizing with If Not Now, in terms of anti-occupation stuff, we're able to draw from our cultures and our histories and what rabbis taught us, what we learn in bar mitzvah, what we learn in day schools, what we learn in camps, and turn it into, turn that tradition and actually practice it. So there are things in Russian, in beautiful former Soviet and Russian traditions that we can draw from that validate the, the, the power of feminism in our thing and that, it, that is the strength that we could draw from. And we should discuss in the next talk maybe other people about where we could uh, pull from that well for that power that we need right now. And that, that, that actually will short circuit the, the person thinking because now we're talking about their, their grandmother, we're talking about their teacher, we're talking about their sister, we're talking about their daughter, we're talking about historical women figures uh, in, in, in former Soviet Union uh, that we can draw upon and, and build power with. And I just wanna add that we had, had invited Olga Tomkin who started anti-Trump Soviet immigrants to be here. Uh, but she just she just couldn't make it for personal reasons. Did you want to? I was just gonna say. Just one, I think maybe one more question. Or this, or maybe maybe uh, two more. Okay. Hi, my name is Daniel. Um, my question is: There seems to be a disconnect in um, the way people think about Russians. For example, like oh, when we were, when you guys were saying earlier that um, like there seems to be this factor of not just trauma, but that like. They want to be, uh, they want to look up to like the strong man. And you know, there's like that stereotype that Russians don't want a democracy and all these things. But like also very clearly in the 90s, they wanted one <laughs> and they tried to make one and then their parliament was dissolved and then it was all sold off. And so like, what's the connection do you think between those two things? Is it the fact that they've, you know, you know, some of them have immigrated here and now they're like, well, we're special, so. I, I guess now we're gonna not care so much for democracy the way that like those in, in Russia did when they fought for it and there were tanks and all these things. 
Yeah, thanks for the questions. It's uh, a point very well taken. Uh, there's this duplicity in the Russian-speaking immigrants of the older generation. They wanted the d d democratic system when uh, it, it was um, of some use for them. And uh, when that stage of their lives was over, unfortunately, uh, I must admit, they don't want anyone to benefit from that system. That, so they uh, now they belong to something else. Now they like... Um, the tough guys. Uh, for instance, uh, subconsciously they are fighting anti-Semitism uh, by thinking that uh, voting for people like Trump, they become less Jewish. Uh, I remember when there then was this day of Holocaust and a younger member of the Trump administration um, Russian speaking by origin, who came here when he was like eight or ten years old. I can't recall his last name. It begins with a B, something like Bronstein, wrote a speech and it was not advertised. And when Trump uh, delivered that speech, uh, which had no mention of the Jews at all, and it was fact checking, it was obvious. There was no mention of the Jews at all. So uh, uh, I asked my audience. What would your reaction be if that speech were, were delivered by Hillary Clinton, who you call a liar? Let's forget about the names. What's in the name? That's the content of the speech. And don't you think that uh, it's a subliminal message to the Jews haters who can see one of their own in the oval, you know, hall now? So this is a duplicity we, we have to face. And um, um, I've been a radical in my life, uh, but I changed a lot because I now I'm more practical. But you, have, you can't afford idealism unless you understand, for instance, you can, that's why all the political candidates promise stuff they cannot fulfill when they uh, get the jobs. And it's not because they're liars. For instance, today, uh, Avigdor Lieberman, who's been at power for 20 years, he never fulfilled any of his promises at all, none of them. But he's an interesting species, politically speaking. So, um, we c and besides, um, Raphael mentioned something which is very true nowadays. There will never be true or false, black and white anymore. There will always be 50 shades of, you know, understanding. And whatever seems untrue to you today might become true tomorrow. I guess my, my feeling is that mm, people are realizing that we don't actually have what, the, as advertised, the democracy. It's never really been tested. It's never been where there was a multi-racial, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-faith, uh, like, uh, agreement. It was always dominated by one voice. So therefore, all the votes, all the laws, all of the institutional power was dictated by one ideology, really. And with, you know, different divisions in there, but really one ideology. And only now, as the country is literally right now becoming tested in a way where, ooh, we suddenly have in our hands a multiracial, multi-faith, multi-ethnic democracy uh, uh, entity, <laughs> right? And uh, now the question is, can this dream that we've always thought is reality, can it actually hold up? Can this experiment actually hold up that it has never held up at, this, at, at, a, at a sustainable way anywhere in the world? Um, so when people come here and they see that it's, all, it's this utopia, the idea of you're coming to this utopia, and then you get here and you realize you're working more than you've ever worked in the Soviet Union, and you're working for the basic things that you had in the Soviet Union to, to a lot of degrees, except during the, the, uh, <laughs> except during the, the troubles. But coming here, it's almost as if it's not a country yet for a lot of people, even beyond former Soviet, that it's a subway system, and we're all just passing each other and touching shoulders and trying to get in the seat first, versus this real idea that's revolutionary <laughs> somehow, that the child's welfare 10 miles from my house 
impacts my well-being directly. Um, and that's where I'm seeing that we, we, we draw from versus this idea of just perpetuating this myth of all these myths that it's just trauma, that it's not just racism, that it's, that it's um, just uh, wanting a strong man versus wanting to take advantage of other people below you, that it's, um, that we have to make practical decisions versus actually try to come and at the root of things and, 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 and fix them. Um, yeah, so I think when people come here and they see that this is a subway system where people are going for, and Trump embodies that, where we're all just fighting for this, another myth of the scarcity of resources. Um, this idea that, that, that we have these finite resources in the wealthiest country in the world, in the wealthiest time in the world, um, creates this artificial feeling that uh, we are in danger. Um, and then that's the only way they can survive now is perpetuating this false idea of danger. Okay, so we started five minutes late, so we'll take one more question. The woman in the back, yes. She's in the back in the jean jacket. Thank you. My name is Rita Vratnovsky. Uh, I'm not a public speaker, and um, even in Russia, in Russian, it was difficult for me to speak in public, but I feel that I have to. So be lenient, please, to my English. Um, I was listening to, to the panel, and uh, I wonder where Mr. Kaplan, I'm not addressing Raphael, he is too eloquent for me. Uh, where would you place people like me? Because you painted the whole Russian immigration with such a dark paint. There is no room for people who think it looks if I, if I am swept into it, I am this dim vid babushka, racist, uh, and many other bad things. I wish to God there was another president, not Mr. Trump, but I, I think there are many other reasons why Russians voted for Trump or didn't vote, uh, vote at all. And um, I Do you want to tell us what one of those reasons is? What you think one of those uh, reasons is that Russians vote for the Trump? The reasons they didn't trust and uh, they didn't like any, anyone from the Democratic, uh, actually Hillary, mm -hmm. Hillary. And uh, another thing which bothers them and me is political correctness. And uh, it looks for us, I understand that we have absolutely different views on many things, that um, the slogans, the, again, political correctness, uh, hypocrisy, it blossoms lately. And uh, as to go back to the Russian immigration, I wish I were more, <laughs> less nervous. You're doing great. Sorry. Um, there is, percentage-wise, I have no idea how many people uh, who are, uh, who came not just for economical reason, and Mr. Kaplan mentioned that it is good enough reason for many of them but also for freedom, for we came here, we had no idea there is how many parties there are. We knew that we will vote for a person who we would find more, most fit for the office. And many of us at some point voted for Democrats, including me. Uh, many of us abstained from voting because couldn't really make a choice. And um, 
I don't know, Mr. Kaplan, how often you go to the Carnegie Hall, to some other places. There is a strong, big, intelligent community, Russian community, as probably you all know. There is not a single university in the United States where there is no professor of Russian descent. Mostly of them are leftists. And for example, a few days ago, me and my husband, we were kind of screaming at each other. And we realized that our uh, neighbors would think that we are, that this is domestic dispute or whatever. And they wouldn't think that we were screaming because we have a different opinion on some point, <laughs> on some uh, poem. And uh, what else I wanted to say? I made uh, some notes. So again, I don't know percentage-wise how many people like that. How many people uh, we have a I, I, lot of friends, and they <clears throat> have a lot of friends who are. Uh, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Everybody understands your question. I'm sorry to interrupt so you because of the your, time frame. Your uh, generation, uh, your generalization was uh -huh. a way to simplify it and quite arrogant. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, generalizing is what we are here for. <laughs> the basic uh, question which was put up in front of your speakers today, Raphael and my humble self, was uh, it started with what is the Brighton Beach community is. Brighton Beach is not a geographical location. Brighton Beach is a state of mind. And Bright Brighton Beach uh, inhabitants could reside anywhere, and they may not even speak Russian at all. But how can you possibly um, generalize if you uh, try to describe a, f a typical Russian family, uh, which uh, is like an example to be followed, a pattern to be followed? Uh, parents work hard, pay for higher education for their kids. Their kids go to Ivy League universities. And then all of a sudden, it turns out that they are left liberal and not like their predecessors. Both of them are Russian, right? Not, not exactly. Once the kids start belonging to mainstream, they are not Russians anymore. They are excluded from the Russian society. Once you become a part uh, of a mainstream, you are not Russian anymore to them. So the half of the population which try to give the best education to their kids, like in self-denial. They produce offsprings which are not their uh, next of kin anymore. Uh, the kids are wise. I, I keep asking my question, uh, the same question to the older generation of my listeners. How come you stopped loving your kids? How come you say that uh, going to Colombia, for instance, uh, they become victims of those professors who were um, liberated in the, in the McCartney era like 60 years ago, but 60 years ago, it's like three or five generations of uh, educators back there. Same thing happened to them because they inherit, like, not, does not, doesn't really matter who you are. All of us have an inner child, and that inner child gets uh, some lessons at the early, you know, stage of our lives. The uh, immigrants from the Soviet Union, they were taught stuff which still um, understood by that inner child among, inside of them. But the inner child and their own ch children is very different. So we have a um, split community. Uh, the kids are smarter, but their parents think that they are brainwashed. Who is to be a judge to that? But I, I think there was a large, what was your name? Rita? That's my mother's name. Uh, Rita, thank you for that. I think it's, it's very interesting because there's a lot of times we're floating into what's unique to former Soviet people and also have to contend with and have the assistance of the bigger story around the whole country and the world. And in the, in the country, there are people who any one of us would call friends 
who would have voted for Obama or anybody and voted for Trump. And you mentioned that once you make a certain decision about values, that by the larger establishment, Russian former Soviet community, that you're no longer considered that. That's true. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the power and, and, and the agency to create our own community legitimately. And part of creating our own community legitimately is actually PC culture, because what he said was not PC. And you were offended, right? Right, but you were offended because he wasn't PC, yet in the same breath, you shared that you were turned off by PC culture. So PC culture is a universalist value where it has to be spread out through, through the whole for you. And, and, and I agree completely with you. I think because you were uh, painting with a very broad brush, I think it was unfair that alienated someone who we could have in, on our side. In a 51% voting democracy, we need everybody. And if we, if we want a popular movement and we don't have room for Rita, we lose. We lose without you. So you want, there is this community, you're welcome in that community. There is this com complexities, there's 50 shades, there's everything. If there's no room for you, we lose. So let's build that new community. Okay, thank you, Rita. And that was a nice, uh, very interesting discussion on which we can bring our panel to a close. I see there are people who have some other questions and I invite you to um, ask the panelists afterward if they are energetic enough to indulge you. Um, so I would just like to thank Seva, Rafael, and Anna for organizing what was, a, I think, a very interesting discussion. Thank you all for coming th you. this evening. Thank you.